He didn't say Trump. He just said what was said yesterday is un-American, un-Republican, not conservative, whatever. Uh, but the question with these people is they are such hypocrites. They are such double talkers. They are supposed to say, I will never support such a person as the nominee of my party to be the president of the United States. Right? Tom Ridge did that. Tom Ridge, former governor of Pennsylvania, former um, member of the Bush machine, certainly, Bush cabinet. Uh, and, of course, he was uh, the head of Homeland Security. He was the founding secretary of the Department of Homeland Security when it was created out of thin air. One thinks uh, for him. He had been defeated um, back in the 90s uh, for, uh, I think he wanted to be a senator. That didn't work for him. But he was the governor of Pennsylvania for quite a while. So uh, he came on television and they asked him, will you support Trump if he's the nominee? And the answer was, not a chance, not a chance. Well, that's not the clear language from Bluebeard or Blackbeard Ryan. Uh, he's you know, hemming and hawing. He said, well, I'm the Speaker of the House, and therefore I'm the chairman of the Republican National Convention, so I can't. Uh, I have to be open-minded and uh, impartial. Yeah, with a Nazi. Thank you. That's a great anti-fascist stance by Bluebeard Ryan. And who's going to be surprised? The guy is from the despicable John Birch Society, who are beneath contempt. We've heard from Carson. But now we have to look at Ted Cruz. This is in some ways the most interesting. This unctuous hypocrite leaves a trail of grease as he moves across the floor. He's like a, uh, a snail advancing on a pseudopod, and it leaves a trail of grease. Think of him like that. The sallow face, unctuous hypocrite, Ted Cruz. Now, he, he, his hypocrisy makes him somewhat more effective than Trump in some ways. He may be more durable because he, uh, he panders to different groups in, in a more, more uh, effective way. Now, notice, in public, he's, he always says, oh, they always want me to attack my friend Donald Trump. I won't do that because, of course, he's hoping to get the legions of dupes and the legions of rage that Trump has uh, gathered around himself. But then, as the New York Times has proven with a tape, Cruz says in private, he says, well, a president must have good judgment. How about Trump? Uh, the obvious. Um, so he attacks Trump in private. Uh, and he's going to have to do that because if he goes into February, February, if Trump is still in the field, as there's every reason to think he will be, then Cruz is probably going to have to start getting rough with Trump. And those supporters are going to have to choose which way they go. A lot of this will depend on how much of a ground operation Trump has. Cruz has a Trump uh, kind of a ground operation in, in Iowa and elsewhere. It's not so clear what Trump has going. I'm sure he's got something, but not maybe that uh, effective. So that's uh, essentially at the end of January, beginning of February, we're going to have the Iowa caucuses. Um, when you look at Cruz, I'm thinking of Robert Lowell's famous line in that poem uh, about the Union dead in the heart of Boston back in the 1950s, a savage servility slides by on Greece. That's Ted Cruz. Uh, stab you in the back, hypocrite, sallow-faced, and that pained, concerned look on his face, right? He's so concerned about the predicament of our country. Now, the other side of this is the U.S. Uh, well, no, actually, let's let's go through some things. You have a brokered convention. A brokered convention is when the whole thing is decided top down, and the floor action is of, of relatively little importance. Now, the one of these was the the group uh, of Republican senators, right? The powerful Republican senators in 1920 
in Chicago put together the classic smoke-filled room. So this was all of these, these senators, and every senator represented one of the trusts, right? one of the monopolies, one of the uh, you know, cartels. This was room 404 of the Blackstone. I think it became the Sheraton Blackstone. But the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago, 1920, a group of senators and power brokers were in a room. It's a small room. It was so full of cigar smoke that you couldn't see from one end of the room to the other. So you'd hear voices speaking out of the way. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking from Washington, D.C. This is our second hour on World Crisis Radio. Uh, why don't you go to TWSP.US, TaxWallStreetParty.US, signified as TWSP.US, and subscribe to the daily briefing of the Tax Wall Street Party. You can also do this through Tarpley.net, and Tarpley.net gets you the full array of all my work, my Twitter, my uh, uh, work in the uh, audio visual realm, and also my books are there. Right, Christmas is coming. Think of uh, how much you'd like to challenge the uh, essentially ignorant prejudices, the ignorant Philistine banal prejudices of some relative and uh, enlighten them with a copy of one of my uh, books. Uh, but now let's, um, we're going to go into our foreign news in just a minute, but this change in the U.S. climate that allows us to see at least, right, the, the, uh, the outlines in the mist of how the Republican Party might be destroyed. That is some of the best Advent holiday news that anyone could think of, right? It's going to be, what, St. Lucie's in a couple of days, uh, the Festival of Lights, and uh, and therefore uh, we're uh, looking, you know, we're trying to get enough light so we can see how the Republicans will go down. So uh, here's the idea. The brokered convention is typically the smoke-filled room. Room 404, Blackstone Hotel, right, Chicago, 1920. Warren Gamaliel Harding, a little-known contender, chosen by these Wall Street-controlled uh, senators, hacks and thugs, and he becomes the nominee. Now, uh, there's also something called an open convention. This is actually a demand. I've worked on this at different times. Say, 1976, there was a demand, uh, and 1980 also, perhaps 1980 is a better example. In, in 1980, it was important, would have been important for Ted Kennedy's uh, forces to get some exposure on the, you know, the, the debate, right, that they control some of the time. But uh, Jimmy Carter, with his machine of thugs, uh, were, was able to uh, to shut that down. So 1976, well, 1980 in particular, not an open convention for the Democrats. Uh, the other uh, way you can look at this is a contested convention. A contested convention is what might happen if there is no top-down control. Well, let's let's just go through the the con the contested the most contested of all was the uh, uh, 1860 1860, right? Right before the Civil War. In 1860, the Democratic National Convention met in Charleston, South Carolina. They balloted for 10 days and could not agree on a candidate, because the, the Democrats, uh, for the second half of the 19th century up till 1936, the Democrats had a two-thirds majority requirement. So this sometimes led to their, you know, lots and lots of ballots. Uh, but in the 1861, uh, April 1860, Democratic National Convention met in South Carolina, could not agree, and then reconvened in Baltimore, Maryland, two months later, but also could not 
do anything, uh, could not agree on a candidate, and then split. So we have two wings of the Democratic Party. The Northern delegates nominated Stephen Douglas of Illinois and the Doctrine of Popular Sovereignty, Squatter Sovereignty, which was bad. And the other one was uh, the Proto-Confederates. They uh, nominated John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky, which called for the defense, uh, you know, the, the extreme ideological defense of slavery in all of the territories, not just south of the Missouri Compromise Line, but all of them. And then, uh, so that meant the, that party had split. That was the most, uh, uh, un, you know, unbrokered, the most contested that we that we've seen. Um, and then, of course, the, in May, the Republicans were supposed to nominate Seward, but to get the West, they nominated uh, Lincoln. So uh, those are the the variations. Brokered convention, smoke filled room. Open convention. Worthwhile, but hard to get under certain circumstances. Contested convention, if there's no uh, group at the top that's running things. And indeed, we may be close to a contested Republican convention because maybe this group at the top who kid themselves that they're the power brokers, they represent precious little except a lot of money, media contacts, insider stuff, right? But in terms of the, the raw power of the streets, uh, they don't have that. I think what we uh, what we have here, as I suggested before, is a stop Trump movement. Uh, the 1976 one was between uh, Gerald Ford and Reagan, and Ford came in there just a few dozen votes short of what he needed, and eventually went over the top uh, with the help of uh, you know all kinds of nefarious uh, tricks. Um, so you get the idea. There are all these variations. And a lot of them have not been seen for a long time because usually, as you know, it's a very banal, very stupid photo op, not entertaining, you know, low ratings, not interesting because they don't talk any substance. They just want to tell you how great they are. Remember when, when Kerry got to the a Democratic convention, I think, in Boston in 2004, and he saluted and said he was reporting for duty. This was the attempt of the, uh, the Democrats to wrap themselves in the flag of uh, warmongering and so forth. So anyway, the Stop Trump uh, movement is there, but a Stop Trump movement supported by Reince Priebus and, and you know, the large powers of the Republican National Committee – that's going to be seen as unfair treatment by the Donald, so he may be out of there. Um, we've also got, however, to think about this. The impact of Trumpism, in other words, the seeming short-term success of demagogy and racism and bigotry and fascism, Nazism, these aspects of Trump have undoubtedly excited the imagination of some of these fascistoid members of the Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives. How extreme will they be right now? And it's it's going to be specific. Uh, apparently, they're rather extreme. The goal had been to pass the necessary spending bills by midnight tonight, as I speak to you. In other words, it's the afternoon of Friday, the 11th of December, 2015. Uh, within six or eight hours, those uh, appropriations bills, those spending bills, were supposed to have been passed, yet they have not been passed. There is chaos. So yesterday, the Senate approved a five-day continuing resolution to keep spending at what are now the levels of the uh, 2015 budget, passed you know more than a year ago, uh, and the, the House I think is going to be in the process of passing that too. God knows you can't uh, you can't take anything for granted. So the idea is that that will be five days. That will get us to next Tuesday, Wednesday, something like this. Um, so that is. Uh, the framework. But now, 
Will. Free.